we are really excited to welcome you to the artist talks for this year's master uh school of art 45th annual master of fine arts thesis exhibition uh, we're, this is day one out of day three of these talks, and we're particularly excited about them because this is also the Blaffer Art Museum's 50th anniversary. So um, it's the 45th anniversary of this exhibition and the 50th anniversary of the museum. So that is something really special. Today, uh, we're really thrilled to, to introduce uh, five speakers, Corey Reeves, we're gonna start with Corey Reeves in painting, and then uh, Brian Ellison, Photography and Digital Media, um, and Joe Feniger, IPEF, and finally, Kat Martinez, Sculpture. So they we're gonna kind of make the rounds today of the first floor and, uh, and look at all of these artworks, starting with Corey. Uh, Corey Reeves has, has grew up throughout the United States, uh, traveling and moving from place to place and received his BFA in, in studio art at the University of Texas at Tyler. Reeves has participated in several group exhibitions throughout Texas, including Art Space 111, South Dallas Cultural Center, Work Hub, and Blaffer Art Museum. Currently, Reeves will receive his degree uh, with a concentration in painting from the School of Art at the University of Houston. So, so welcome. Take it over. <laughs> you can just uh, t tell us about the, the premise of your work. Tell us about the inspirations and motivations behind it. Like what's inspired, what are these works here? What's this series of work about? All right, I guess where it starts is, as you said, I've moved around a lot. There's a certain type of place I've noticed, all the places I've lived. I mean, we're talking small towns, middle of the desert, tourist traps up in the mountains, big cities, you know, pretty good variety of places. A certain kind of place, which that's where these kind of dwell in, is the idea of the place as a concept. So certain kinds of places like these tend to exist everywhere, at least here in America, everywhere I've been, they're always there. Kind of a very certain vibe of place. A little bit old, very worn out, lived in. That's how I would describe them. So where the idea of the paintings come from, they kind of dwell in this idea of the threshold. Um, threshold having a few meanings. Of course, the obvious, the most common meaning is kind of a crossing over point. There's another meaning that pertains to, um, another meaning of threshold in which it's this point where a psychological effect begins to happen, which that's what I'm trying to capture with these. They're all meant to be not really creepy per se, not quite scary, just a little bit unnerving, a little uncanny. Um, there's certain psychological ideas that play into that. Um, emptiness, ambiguity, it's not a kind of, it's a kind of place you're not quite sure if it's open or closed. Is it alive or dead? Are there people here? Are there not? It's just kind of this weird isolated place that you yourself are trapped in by yourself and it's just meant to be you and that singular place and what you're taking away and feeling from it. Can you maybe walk us through one of the paintings and kind of show us some of the, the clues, the visual clues? Sure. Let's go with this one over here. This is probably the best out of the series. So there's a few different things going on. One, Like I said, um, worn out, it's kind of old. You don't really see motels like this aren't really a common thing in like high use anymore. They're kind of a relic of the older highway system. At this point, that's more of a novelty. This one in particular is pretty run down. This one actually is here in Houston. Um, I figure at least one person here has to have seen this one before. I don't know if anyone knows right where it is. This one is here in Houston. Like I said, worn out, very lived in. Um, some of the things that can affect how it plays with your perception. Lighting, you have little hints, corners you can't see around but are lit like this. It's meant to kind of draw your attention. Something's back there, something's lit. There's something kind of drawing you back there, but it's something you, because it's a painting, you obviously can't ever see that. Things like lights on in the windows, is somebody in there, which there was when I went to get a photo of this. That was a whole thing. Um, other things that I do with them is playing with like color, contrast, stuff like that, your usual painterly things. So kind of the way I'll put like greens next to purples, next to red, stuff like that, to kind of give it a little bit more of that uncanny feeling. 
How do the how does the video uh, relate? If these places are the places themselves, the video is more of the in-between places. It's hallways, walkways, parking garages. Um, this word kind of gets a lot of play these days, but liminality, it gets tossed around a lot, but if you actually go into the whole word, um, the architectural meaning of, of what would be like a liminal place are these kind of places, your in-between transitionary areas, which in turn are also thresholds, which in turn, uh, Liminal comes from the Greek word for threshold. So it's kind of meant to be the sim something similar. It's something where you're being presented with a place that's very familiar. It's very much a part of our world, but kind of a level removed in an uncanny kind of way. It's not something you could really pinpoint probably on a lot of them. Make sure that doesn't fall. Um, it's meant to be a similar thing. You're given this sense of anticipation. Something's happening, something might be going on here, but there's no actual payoff. And that kind of anticipation just leaves you kind of like, it's an unsatisfied feeling. It's like, I need to know what's supposed to happen, what's supposed to go here, but you're never given that. You'd mentioned um, that there's also like a feeling of, you know, what's the perspective of the viewer? Uh, where I draw, the way that they're composed is meant to actually kind of call back to film. I draw a lot of influence from film more so than actual paintings or anything like that. So I try to shoot them all, whenever I go out and take reference photos, I try to shoot them all like establishing shots out of a movie. So that's why they're all kind of this, well, camera view. They're all from a very eye le kind of eye level, very human perspective. They're not anything crazy low to the ground or crazy up high. It's very much meant to be sort of an establishing shot. Reasoning behind that goes kind of back to that sense of anticipation. Establishing shots are meant to build up anticipation. It's meant to be like, here's a place, here's what's going to happen. Um, so the idea of doing a really long establishing shot where it kind of just, where it goes on for too long and it just builds and builds and builds and you're like, okay, what's going to happen? But the thing here is, that's what this is. It's an establishing shot that's never going to end because it's just a singular image. So what are some of the sources? You mentioned film. What are some of the sources for inspiration for you? Uh, your work. I had to pick two big ones. I mean, it's probably obvious to everyone who looks at him. David Lynch, of course, the way he shoots his film and shows, you know, especially something like Twin Peaks would be the big one. It's kind of like every town USA. It's these places, like I said, these could be anywhere. You could, it's the kind of places you could have driven by a hundred times and never noticed them. At least until that one time you drove by and it just really caught your eye and you kind of immediately feel that in your chest where you're like, That's, that place is giving off kind of a weird feeling. Um, really look at is Kiyoshi Kurosawa. Um, he's got some psychological horror films and he does some really, really good cinematography with them. Uh, the way, you, the, again, a lot of long shots, a lot of just holding on a scene to kind of build up mood and a little bit of a dread. It, it's, it's kind of drawing from stuff like that. I think I want to open it up to questions from all of you. Um, uh, Many of you are familiar with this work. Some of you might not be. Uh, what are your questions? I'll ask the first question. Um, so I was curious, where did you get these video tapes from? Uh, the tapes themselves. The tape get in place. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, <laughs> jokes. I found just a lot of blank tapes on eBay. And I was just like, cool. Someone's got like five blank tapes. I'll just, that's what I need. I just need to rip some open and use them for the piece. Uh, most of them were just trying different atmosphere to see where that goes. Off, night's the easy one. That goes back to like just being human. We're not like designed to be in the dark. That's where like fear that art comes from. And even though it's not like a childish, like I'm afraid of the dark, there's still that. We can't see in the dark. We're not nocturnal. We're not meant to be run out and about. It's, you always feel on edge if you're like, if you're outside in an empty parking lot at night, you just feel on edge. And so those are like the obvious ones. It's like easy. I want to see if I can get that same feeling in the daytime though. You know, it's, can I get, achieve that same feeling of like isolation and kind of like that tingle if it's broad daylight.
Thank you. That's actually, I was finding a good, wanting a good entry into that. It's not so much the size, it's the proportions. They're all 4.3, they're 40 by 30. So they're 4.3 aspect ratio, just like an older CRT TV would be. My reason behind that, it's not going to affect everyone. Not everybody's going to look at a CRT at that size and immediately feel anything from it. But I think a certain group, I'd say 25 and up, maybe 30 and up at this point, are going to have probably like deep set memories of staying up late and catching like some horror film or something at like midnight. The kind of film that you would see establishing shots like this in. So the kind of idea is that for, the, for it to be one of those things that you don't notice but your brain does, where you look at it and you, you're being presented with something that's composed like a shot from a movie that's the same kind of proportions as what you would have watched those movies on. So it's just kind of meant to trigger kind of a deep like subconscious thing. But unlike the shot from the movie, then nothing then goes into a narrative. So we talked about this a little bit um, before, how the, the, the viewer themselves kind of, uh, the buildings are very anonymous, but that, that lends sort of what seems to be a little bit of an air of anonymity to the person viewing the work too, because right. we're, we're kind of waiting for this. Right, and that, that is one thing, if we're talking about narrative, mm -hmm. Usually the one of the best reactions I get is whenever people, pe a lot of the times people will have something that they find within these where it's like accesses some locked away memory where it's like, oh yeah, I remember someone had a great one about like the vi a video store. They remember going to a store like that as a kid and they would see like, you know, that red curtain out of the corner of their eyes, the adult section, and just feel like weird about it. And it's like, I didn't think about that looking at this, but it's like, yeah, that's, I think there's different people, you can look at this and be like, oh yeah, I've been to a theater just like that. It's like, I can smell it. I can like feel the hard plastic seats and think of like scratched up film being run through an old beat up projector. It's there, the buildings themselves are anonymous enough that they could be anywhere. But because of that, I feel that viewers can attach some kind of memory to that. What is it? Lynch. Yeah. And then the and yeah. Uh, well, I talked about like some of his movies and shows. Right, right. So, so, like, yeah, it could. I haven't. I don't think I actually saw that one until this show. I don't think cool I saw one. that one. Kind of yeah. <laughs> I guess like if I were to say a few like metaphors or good ways to think about them. Um, it's our world, it's recognizable as our world, that's what these places are, but it's like one step below it, if that makes sense in a way. Um, another way to kind of think about like the mood I'm trying to get, has anyone here ever driven through like the desert before? Just like taken off across Route 66 through the middle of nowhere? But like in the 90s, when all you, when you don't have, when you like maybe at best you'd have a couple cassettes or a couple CDs in your car, there's this okay so here's the scenario you're driving through the middle of nowhere you just it, it's quiet you want you just want something other than the road noises so you fiddle around with the radio right and you're scanning 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 you're not finding anything but static occasionally you'll pick up this faint hum of something you'll hear music faintly come in for a minute just enough for you to know something's there but not really know what it is that's kind of the vibe you're meant to get from these it's like you're almost like hearing something from them in a way, but it's not quite defined. Okay, so what's next for your work? Do you think this will lead to a new body of work for you? Um, right now I've kind of pivoted. I've started working on miniatures more. I think there's some things I could do with actually building the places that could work differently from painting them. Obviously a three-dimensional piece could be more like immersive, even small scale than a painting. But there's also some other things I want to try with the paintings. I need to go back to watching movies. I've just been so busy lately that I've got like a stack of movies I bought and they've just been sitting there for like a year waiting to be watched. And it's like, I need to sit down and watch some stuff, find some new influences, new inspiration, look at color palettes, different ways to compose my shots and stuff. 
So I do want them to grow, I, you know, change up the size a bit, smaller, bigger, see what that does for them. Maybe throw out the whole 4-3 thing because nobody really ever, I've known, met, like, not even met, I've heard that, like one person looked at them and actually picked up on that. So there's more I want to do, but for the time being, I think it's just kind of experimenting with some different mediums and stuff to get these same ideas across. Well, thank you. Um, let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, we're going to trans uh, transfer ourselves and, look and go to look at Br Brian's work. And those of you who uh, may, uh, we'll take a moment here and you can get stools if you don't have them. I recommend that. And we'll just take a moment here. All right, so we switched, it wasn't too hard. We weren't that far away. <laughs> um, everyone, uh, I'd like to introduce Brian Ellison. He was born in the north side of Tulsa, Oklahoma and is based in Houston. In 2007, Ellison received a Bachelor of Arts in Photography from Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland. It wasn't until 10 years later that Ellison would pick up the camera again and ever since has not put the camera down and uses it as a vessel to capture permanence. permanence. The artist is currently pursuing a Master of Fine Arts degree, about to graduate, uh, from the School of Art, University of Houston. Uh, and he is the founder of the nonprofit organization, The Black Man Project, and is working on a book entitled The Beauty That Hides in Plain Sight, featuring short stories uh, told through photography photographs. Ellison's work has been featured in exhibitions in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Seattle, Washington, and in Houston. So, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Can I make one correction? <laughs> yeah. My uh, undergrad was in sociology, not photography. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So then, in that case, let's start off with that. <laughs> uh, what led you to, uh, to move to, towards uh, photography from sociality? Um, I think uh, I was always a photographer as a kid. I just didn't have a title for it. Um, taking pictures and remembrance um, is something that I gravitated towards because losing a very close family member early in life made me, I was pulled to those pictures and I would often, like from that point on, um, think about when I'm in spaces with family or friends, like who's gonna remember these moments, who's gonna capture these moments, and I want to be able to revisit these spaces um, in the event that you know those people that I cherish and love uh, transition. So that is like kind of like this little tr trauma thing that really pushed me into like photography and film and recording. So this, this body of work uh, includes, that we're seeing here, includes both pho photography and video, and most notably, you're sitting in a chair. Right. Can you explain how these objects relate to each other? Um, safe spaces, like the barbershop is one of the first spaces where I went and I was able to kind of talk openly about my feelings, about my first crush and I didn't feel judged. It was also a space that I sat in where I heard a lot of conversations between like very ignorant people and very smart people. And I was able to kind of pull from those conversations what I wanted to incorporate into my life. Um, and when I think about barbershops, even just the history, uh, historically that is a space that black men could gather and feel safe and talk about what planning looked like for the future. Um, what type of movements they had um, pending and that they were gonna move forward with uh, the barbershop just historically um, just captivates, I mean not captivate, the barbershop historically just really speaks to a space of comfort, um, community, and um, conversation. How do we see the idea of community or the, all of those ideas reinforced throughout your work? Um, so going from like my left, wait, your right, my left, I don't know. Anyway, so I'm gonna start with the visual quilt. Um, the visual quilt, I can't quilt, I cannot sew, um, but my grandmother and great-grandmother could. And so, um, but the, uh, the idea of a quilt is like pulling from these different things and making one big thing. 
And so in this video collage, visual quilt, is like some of the videos of things that I shot and then things that I seen that really are important to me. These little small nuance moments of uh, just conversation, um, love, um, pain, all these different things are happening in this visual quilt. And it's also like just information, uh, giving people perspectives that they probably never thought about before. Um, this speaks, these two images behind me speak to like the first time I got a haircut. It was by my friend's big brother and it was a really bad haircut. But it was, and it was a chili bowl, like literally put a chili bowl on your head and then it was just, it was just bad. But those moments, um, just speak to community. You know, a lot of my haircuts, my first haircuts were outside uh, with somebody who pulled up a chair and who might've had a clipper or two that they got from Walmart that didn't work that well. And so, but it was just a lot of community building, a lot of trust. You have to trust someone to sit in a barber chair. Um, and then speaking specifically to this barber chair, I've never seen a barber chair inside of a museum. I've never seen, um, I've, someone get their haircut inside a museum. Oftentimes when I was growing up, when I went to the museum, I did not see things that were a representation of me. And so for me to put this barber chair here and have a black man cutting people's hair, I wanted someone um, to speak to the 10 year old me like in this space. And so when kids, like for example, my son was able to sit in this chair in this space and the museum would resonate with him differently than it did when I was a kid. So that was very, very important to me. It was a bold move. I used the bubble wrap because it's a space to be handled with care and softness. Um, so that's very important. Everything is intentional. And then speaking specifically about this work, um, it dives into, I was in education for 10 years. And one of the first stats that I remember is that they take third grade test scores to determine how many prisons they're gonna build in the future. And it just made me, I remember like being angry and like super sad, because instead of building more resources to help those kids instead of prisons, it's like, it was just like, what are we fighting against? As educators, as people, um, are these kids even kids? Or are they just, are they just a scantron, you know? I don't know, it just made me kind of a little bit of uh, just sad about the future. And so I just kind of wanted to talk about that. One of the pictures is me when I was in pre-K. I'm the big, big head boy in the back. Um, and then this one is my son. I mean, he, he has to navigate a very similar reality. And I do my best to um, filter some of the things that I had to, to deal with. But um, yeah, it just deals with wanted to protect, it deals with society as we know it and how we navigate it and things that I want to change, you know. Yeah. Moving um, throughout this, the, the video weaves in more complicated narratives. Can you kind of walk us through? I know the sound is not on right now because we're having the talk, but it does contain sound. Oh, okay, I thought you were saying this sound was not on. Like, yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> There's a piece that just showed uh, with me on a treadmill, and that piece uh, really just speaks to capitalism. It speaks to a, um, the journey of life of feeling the need to do all the things and still not get to where you think you should be or get to where you think you should be and still feeling overwhelmed, still feeling insufficient, not feeling enough. Um, it's just the tread, the tread of life that we are on. And it was specifically speaking to that, but it also speaks to joy and love and like the idea of black boys not having an early expiration date because black boys do, their expiration date um, of boyness is a lot earlier than other boys. Um, specifically, you know, just the experience of, you know, when they get 12 or 13, they're no longer seen as boys anymore. They're seen as a threat. And so it speaks a lot to that, in my experience, ingrained in that, um, having the first three times a gun that's ever been pulled on me being, being by the police. And the first time being when I was in the third grade. 
I'm looking down the barrel of a gun of a, that a police officer has to my head. So it's, it's really talking about those experiences. It's, uh, yeah, it's just kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a loaded, loaded visual quilt, if you will, you know? It's like a lot of tra traumatic shit in there, but I think it's also a lot of beautiful shit, you know, at the same time. Can we say shit? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so why did you choose to, um, to put the film in, in the frame? It's been sitting in my studio for a while. Um, a good friend of mine, Michael Healy, gave it to me, and uh, one of his mentors gave it to him. And um, Michael Healy is, uh, he's the reason that I am a, a kind of, I tapped into the art world in Houston. Um, so I was paying homage to him. He's a good friend of mine. And he's really um, been an impactful person in my life. So how does this relate to the book that you're putting together? Does this series, do these different bodies work, go together? Sure. All my work is about the beauty that hides in plain sight. The beauty that hides in plain sight just means that we get accustomed to seeing things so much that we no longer see it as beautiful. Some people can attest to that with their partner. You know, they just get on their nerves. They don't see them as beautiful anymore because they see them every day. But one of my missions is to always see things with new eyes as if I, as if I was seeing it for the first time. Um, and that is what my photography and film is about. It's just like never forgetting to see the beautiful in the flower, even though I see the flower every day. So all of that work, all of this work speaks to, to that. So I'm gonna open it up to questions and um, I'm gonna kind of paraphrase the questions because I think that they can't be picked up by the audio. So um, does anyone have questions? Are people in the community to being photographed? Um, are they open to what you know what is happening? Or do you explain to them what is going on? Every picture I take is a collaboration piece. It can't exist without them. So um, I like to first just tell them who I am and what I do and why I'm taking a picture of them and what they embody to me when I take the picture. And some people say yes, some people say no. Either way, it's just this mutual respect and I'm thankful. Um, one of the habits I try to you know, keep is making sure I take the pictures back to those community members. So it's just not something that is like I'm holding on. Like they get to see themselves in the eyes through me. And I think um, that is what a collaboration is. That's what, and it's important. So the question was, um, how receptive are people to, um, to getting their picture taken? So, how, so that, that makes me ask you, what is your process like uh, in working with, because you are working with people that you right. know. My process is I'm either walking, driving, or skating. I see something that resonates with me and I stop and I talk to the person and I just ask. Um, and sometimes I just show them some of my work first um, so they can kind of get an idea. Because, you know, a lot of people are skeptical because these people will get taken pictures of and then, you know, sometimes without their permission. And they never get to um, see the thing that they are a part of. And so that's, I mean, it's just a really human experience. Hey, how you doing? My name is, this is what I do. Would you be open to me doing blah, blah, blah? You know, um, I think that is something that we are losing, um, especially with like social media. It helps us, I mean, it not helps, it's taking us away from just like human day-to-day -day interaction. Like, you know, my name is, your name is, that type of thing. So I think it's very important. So when you um, start out, do you have an idea of uh, a concept or does, are you kind of then informed by all of the stories that you hear? Like how do you bring your work together? Like from the initial concept through then what talking to people and getting your source material and then making? 
Mm. Um, as crazy as it sounds, most of, most of the things that I do is informed by music. Music tells me, like if I listen to something and it's, it really touches, resonates my soul, from that point, it's like these ideas start to formulate conceptually and then I build out from that space. It's, it's not something, I call it vesseling, like you are getting a download from something that's a little bit higher than you. Um, and when that is happening, it is my responsibility to then carry it out. It has really nothing to do with me. I'm just a conduit, I'm just a, I'm just a medium to help these things bridge together, you know what I'm saying? And so I think of it like that, like if I don't do it, um, somebody's gonna miss something. And it's so important for me to do it. Other questions? Thank you. Charisma. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was just gonna say, you mentioned Vesselin. I was just curious about like, what kind of like artists inspire you specifically? Cause I feel like your work is so impactful and like you mentioned that like music inspires you. So I was curious about like, what artists like might like inspire your work and like if you could delve into that. That's, that's a great question. Uh, one of my biggest inspirations I feel like um, is definitely Spike Lee. Spike Lee um, visually, aesthetically, you know how he shoots his films, but also Spike Lee introduced me to blues and jazz and classical music. Um, Spike Lee allowed his dad to score his films for a very long time. On top of that, uh, Barry Jenkins, David Hammonds, Gordon Parks, those are all people that are very influential um, in my practice and how I see myself. Um, even recently, um, learning more about the Astor Gates in a way that he, um, his art is just vast and it doesn't have any limits. Those are some things, those are some people that really are impactful and influ influential in my practice. Thank you for asking that. Yes. in him and the way he interacts with the world that maybe were different from what how you were that's a great question do you you want, do you want to paraphrase first <laughs> say it again <laughs> sorry <laughs> i speak quietly um so i'm interested in your relationship with your son and as the work you do to filter things that he receives and bringing him into these places that maybe you didn't have access to as a child um how that manifests in him and how he interacts with the world in ways that maybe you didn't because you lacked these things right. Uh, one of the key things that I didn't have access to as a child was communication. And so one of the biggest ways I see this impacting my son is that I check in with him and ask him how he feels, how he sees the world, um, what are some things that I can do better as a parent. Um, you know, we do these check-ins like, what am I good at and what do I suck at really bad? You know what I'm saying? And so. I did not have those type of things uh, growing up. Nobody uh, gave an apology, even if they were in the wrong. And I also tell my, my kids, like, I'm a very, I'm a human, and I make mistakes. And when I make mistakes, I apologize to them, because I need them to know, like, just because I'm a, I'm a dad doesn't mean I have it all figured out. I'm actually freestyling, making all this stuff up, doing the best I can, you know what I'm saying? And so giving them that perspective and then allowing them to respond and give me feedback. Um, I think that's the most, outside of anything, or anything that I could ever give, I think giving them that, that space to communicate that with me and to themselves is the most impactful thing by far that I could give. There's time for one last question, at least. Um, so we see you sitting on the barber chair on top of uh, the bubble wrap and during the opening uh, you had done a performance. Um, what role does performance play in your practice as well as your, um, you know, your video and your photography? That's a great question. You know, I can't, one of the cool things about being in the, the MFA program here is um, the opportunity to collaborate with so many beautiful minds. Um, I spend a lot of time in the sculpture department. I spend a lot of time in the painting department, IPEF, just the mixing and meshing of minds 
has been by far the most impactful thing here. On top of that, it has a, allowed me to explore something that I was afraid to explore before, and that was a performance. And that has become probably, I don't know, one of my most, one of the things I look to forward most as an artist is performance art. And so um, this program has opened up the idea of the vastness of what art is and how we can explore it and how it doesn't have to live in a box. You know, I came in as a photographer, but I'm leaving and so much more. And so, um, and I just want to continue to explore those corners and crevices of what art is and really just interrogate the fuck out of it by asking questions, you know what I'm saying? And I'm okay with not always having the answers, but just diving into the practice and, uh, and seeing what comes up. Thank you, Brian. I said three cuss words. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to this perspective of the, the gallery. Um, we are pleased to welcome Joe Penniger. Uh, Joe was born in uh, the rural city of Mansfield, Ohio, and, in, and is now based in Houston. Penniger uses art as a starting point to create a discussion. Uh, Penniger received her Bachelor of Science in Clinical Lab Laboratory Sciences at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston and an Associate of, of Applied uh, Science in, in Medicine from, the state, from San, San Jacinto College. Prior to pursuing a, a career in the arts, uh, Penniger worked at MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center in a, in a laboratory. Uh, the artist's latest exhibition, uh, The Women's Life in Freedom Show, at the Elgin Street Studio, uh, and that was just, when was that exhibit? Um, earlier this year. January. Just earlier this year, okay. And, uh, and Penniger is curr currently pursuing an MFA with a concentration in sculpture at the School of Art. So welcome. Thank you. Um, I would like to make a, a correction. Um, so my concentration began in graphic design, and now I'm in IPEF, not in sculpture even though you couldn't tell that by the work I have here. Um, but So I'm gonna start by talking briefly about uh, my process and then about each piece since they're so different. Um, I'll try not to talk too fast, which I tend to do. I'm very, very nervous. <laughs> I have a whole spiel. I'm gonna use my cheat sheet to kind of keep it going and keep it coherent. Um, so yeah, I hope I don't go over my time too much, maybe just a little, um, we'll see. So I often think about how I engage the world as making collections. So I collect um, objects, feelings, meta, or you know, mental images, comments, and um, it's like this never-ending inventory of perceptions and things that become this vast web of associations that I use for learning and understanding myself and the world. Um, and an aspect of that web, of course, my art is a method for introspection and critical dialogue with myself and the world. Um, and you know, whoever I can really get to pay attention or participate. So the process is pretty similar each time. I'm inspired, I begin to make lists, I make sketches, sometimes write creatively. I prototype, do a lot of kind of fevered and messy material experimentation, and then finally it's on to the work. Uh, the topics are varied. The inspiration is very sporadic and spontaneous and random. Um, as you'll see in the three pieces I have here, it's, it's really evident. And whether it manifests as animation or book design or sound, assemblage or sculpture that you'll see here, at its core, the work is about perspectives. Um, so I present opposing viewpoints, disparate environments, multifaceted ways of being. Um, and first, like I said, I'm gonna talk about each one of the three pieces I have in the gallery um, today. First, urban portals. Um, this is a contemplation of how we as humans kind of exist and experience artificial versus natural environments within a, an urban context. So I visited urban green spaces around Houston and Austin and Brazoria County and kind of just reflected on my experiences and what I saw there. And having been, having been born in the Ohio countryside, Texas is very, very different from what I'm used to. Um, and so as I visited these parks and observed and touched and smelled things, I was always 
kind of agitated. There was this constant agitation and this building up of frustration that just kept happening and happening. I was constantly reminded of where I was not. And so these feelings just kind of built and built and became very intense. But in Austin, um, I discovered Barton Creek and the Barton Springs pool inside the Zilker Municipal Park, close to the city center. Um, and this natural springs pool is crystal clear. It maintains a constant temperature of around 60 degrees, if I remember right. So this was very familiar to me. Um, and so I was immediately filled with joy and all my strong feelings of agitation and frustration were kind of replaced with this joy and this hope. So naturally, loving where I'm at, I jump right in and I start to swim. So I surface the water and as I come up, I see the distorted image of the city buildings, which you can see right from this natural springs pool, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so I immediately start thinking of, you know, portals that you might see in a science fiction movie. So. As afterward, as I return to the city and I begin to live and walk in the city, I see these little cracks and these little fissures, maybe in the broken window of an abandoned building or the concrete that I'm walking on, and I imagine these magical little doorways or portals that I can use, and they're just for me. And I can return to where I want to be, where I'm from, what I recognize, and I'm used to this natural world. So I combine this notion of the sci-fi portal with my version. Oh, let me back up. When I was in the park at Zilker around the Natural Springs pool, um, I encountered these little cairns, which are stacks and assemblages, you know, creative piles of stones created by people. And historically, they've been used to mark our walking in the landscape or maybe create a magical doorway for our loved ones to pass to the afterlife or some other world. So coming back to where I was just a moment ago, using all these feelings and the, you know, the portal kind of notion, I combine these together and get these kind of assemblages that you see back here, these, my version of these cairns, which are my urban portals back in the corner here. Um, and the one farthest there on the top um, has glass as the portal and wood as the scaffolding or the substrate. And because of these two materials in the arrangement that they're in, it tells you that this doorway happens to lead from the natural world to an urban environment, right? Um, so the wood is warm and inviting and it begs one to touch, but the glass is very, very unfriendly. And the piece as a whole always seems like it's right on the edge of chaos, like at any moment it could topple off and harm you. And this sidewalk one is very different. It's much more hopeful. It's as if there's some soft, living, undulating, organic thing that's kind of escaping into freedom. Um, next, I'll talk about Arrested Development, which is the collection of cement figures at the top of the stairs on the landing. Um, this is a representation of a few perspectives or states of being that exist in a singular place, which is the traumatized child's mind. So the main character is presented in different sizes. So this indicates um, you know, physical growth, but that's like the only change that's happening. Otherwise, she's identical. So I'm trying to show the passage of time regardless of one's success with personal development um, after traumatic events that can either halt or retard you know, your psychological development throughout life and in different ways. Um, so the physical appearance of all the characters is kind of haunting and anomalous. Their limbs are very long and thin and seem weak and frail, but nevertheless, these three characters kind of unite and combine forces for self-healing. Um, they're participating in a version of Pluck the Daisy, or as you might be more familiar with, um, He Loves Me, He Loves Me Not. So they're taking the daisy petals off, removing them and you know, breaking them, and then using a method um, reminiscent of kintsugi, which is the Japanese art of ceramics repair, to put them back together as they want and reattach them to the daisies, which symbolize innocence, transformation, and rebirth. Um, but instead of using gold, which is traditional for kintsugi, I decided to use orange, which is, for me, symbolizes this kind of playful, angry, aggressive rebellion so that I can mark and highlight these moments of trauma and healing rather than try to describe, disguise them or pretend that they don't, aren't there or don't exist. Um, next and lastly, Pissing Contest of Gods and Men. Uh, this piece here, obviously, is there's a lot going on, <laughs> a lot going on. 
I am aggressively and overtly speaking about patriarchy in these um, major branches of Abrahamic religions. Um, I use visual idiomatic language um, in the form of a pissing contest and the pot calling the kettle black um, to add a little bit of levity, but also maybe some nuanced understanding of that patriarchy and how it affects women and children everywhere, even if they're completely unaffiliated. So the splatters everywhere say many things. Uh, for example, the pedestals that elevate the clergymen are very white and clean and pristine still, despite the presence of so much splatter in proximity. So that says a thing. Um, the splatter on the other bodies and in the environment um, throughout say other things. They talk of the impacts on your path in life, your socioeconomic struggles, your employment, your relationship to your children, your ability to have children or how many, you know, birth control, um, your physical and personal freedom or lack thereof. Uh, the framing devices are, they function to draw the viewer's eye to certain moments and maybe spark a conversation or just prompt someone to say, what am I seeing here? And then begin to make stories and meaning for themselves in their own way using the references they have from their own life. Um, I want people to consider the impact on children based on their gender, whether they're male or female, and the nature of their relationships with the adults in their lives. Um, and as you know, many women kind of in these communities, they don't have options for rising up or fighting back, but many do. And if you are familiar with these branches, you'll know that there are women in this tableau that are kneeling and teaching their children, their sons and their daughters voluntarily. So this piece invites some conversation about the role of women in these patriarchal systems, as well as the roles of men. Um, and even though we're all familiar with and kind of wary of hearing and talking about sexual abuse in the Catholic Church and every church, the violent enforcement of religious tradition or the oppressive mixing of church and state here in the US, I feel like the conversation can't stop until these things don't happen anymore. While they're still happening, we, we must keep talking. And if I'm lucky, this piece or some other piece in the future will kind of speak to someone and let them know that they're not alone that there are people that think like they do, and it's okay to speak, and in fact, we must. Um, this piece is the screaming voice of a like mind, because there can be no conversation if we're afraid to speak. And that concludes my words, so if there are any questions. Yes, um, so your work encompasses a range of media and a range of concepts. How did the different bodies of work lead to each other? Um, and inform each other, maybe. Now that, you, now that you've seen them all together, how do you think they're kind of informing each other? Um, well, I think I have a tendency, or I'm beginning to work more with these figurative tableaus. I'm mean, handling them in different ways. So, you, you know, the ones at the top of the stairs, I'm handling it a little differently rather than just found objects. They're more manipulated. And so there's kind of a, as one of my committee members said, um, a blending of this type of my work with this type of work. And so I'm bringing my craft into the figurative tableaus more. Um, but other than that, they're really, they don't speak to each other necessarily, because like I said in, in um, my little spiel, um, my inspiration is very spontaneous and it can come from a conversation that I overhear in the grocery store or something in the library or something my grandkids say or something that just pisses me off. It's just the more I feel, the more likely it's, it is to come out in my artwork. So that's how they're connected, mm -hmm. I feel. So did the concepts lead to um, like which media you're gonna work in? Uh, yeah, most of the time, um, sometimes it's just the path of re least resistance, right? So I needed to make a large group of people and it's very time consuming to create a live person or a life-size person. And so I use these bought things and then cut them up and bent them and put them the way I wanted to. Um, these abstracts back here, obviously the materials are related to representations of where I am versus where I want to be. And so sometimes, yes, the material has to do with the concept, sometimes no. Questions from the group? So I was curious about the significance of the use of blue in this piece. Oh, yes. Um, so indigo, uh, indigo, 
that's a little embarrassing to say, but this piece was kind of inspired by a song by a band called Tool, and it's called The Pot. So if you're interested, look at those lyrics. Don't pay attention to the interpretations online. You kind of make your own. But um, the color indigo has kind of opposite meanings depending on how you're thinking about it. So they can stand for like really rigid and authoritative kind of tradition or creativity and creative action. So it's, it's mostly about the authority. In your bio, it's mentioned that you come from um, uh, am I correct, biology, medicine? Mm. How does that relate to your practice today? Um, I think not only my practice, but life in general, because the more you learn about the little intricacies of life and the way all of our particles are just traveling through the universe and bumping into each other and resonating with each other, I, I guess I've gained some insight and some real appreciation about the relationship we all have with each other and everything, animate or inanimate, that we share in the universe. So that that I guess resonance would be the way to speak about what that discipline did for me, resonance with everything else around me. Other questions? What's next? Uh, well, as I mentioned, part of my time here was spent in graphic design and only this past year has been in IPEF, so I have to say that since moving into this place that I seem to fit better, um, I've had this explosion of ideas. So for now, I'm just, I'm just gonna work through my sketchbook and get these things that are itching my brain out into the world. So hopefully I make some money at that, but if I don't, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, they, they have to come out. So this is a new version of me as an artist that I'm just still exploring and getting to know. So that, that's my path, get to know myself and what it means to me to be this type of artist. Yeah. All right, thank you. speaker for the day and and then we will go on to invite you to uh, join us for lunch and conversation uh, with the artists afterwards uh, so our final speaker for today will be Catherine Martinez Catherine Martinez is a multidisciplinary visual artist based in Houston Martinez previously received her Bachelor in Fine Arts with a concentration in sculpture from the University of Houston and is now completing her MFA in, in studio art with a concentration in sculpture. The artist is a former Project Row Houses summer studio artist in 2018 and a contributing artist uh, of We, we Hear Black Women's uh, Art Collective and, uh, would, and created the Black Women's uh, Road Trip Collective. What are those collectives? Oh man, those are fun <laughs> collectives. <laughs> well, they're telling like kindred stories in the uh, We Here Black Women's Collective, and we're telling, you know, like our way of expressing ourselves through our different art practices. So there's like multidisciplinary artists in that. The Black Women's Road Trip Collective, that was a collective with a group of my friends here from uh, the university, Saron Alderson, um, Jamie uh, Robinson, and myself. And we went on a southern voyage, so to speak, like um, where we ended up in a, uh, a city that we read about in a book by Zora Neale Hurston, The Last Barracoon, and we ended up in Africa Town. So that was a really great journey. Okay, well, welcome to CAD. <laughs> Thanks for the little, you know, in, extra info. And we'll invite you to uh, get started and talk about your work. All right, thank y'all for coming out. Um, I um, have a love affair with steel. I cannot get away from using it <laughs> in my work. Um, I learned a bit of family history. Um, through my mother and my grandfather. My grandfather's grandfather, um, which my grandfather, he was born in 1906. Um, so just kind of telling you a little bit about my age. <clears throat> uh, but um, his grandfather uh, was brought to this country in, uh, according to the census in 1835. Um, and he was on a plantation in Claiborne County, Mississippi as a blacksmith. He was brought here specifically for his blacksmith skills long after um, 
and people uh, were not allowed to bring enslaved people from Africa. So um, a lot of my work, you'll see I'll delve in still. And uh, the work has been referred to as like windows on history um, um, in multiple uh, pieces of my work. Um, they're like these portals. And so I really played on that, um, on that narrative about the work when it came to this piece uh, here. This piece, uh, Meditation in Three Parts, uh, uses uh, a piece of history from the Rothko Chapel. A dear friend and mentor and professor of mine uh, gifted me a window um, she uh, received from the Rothko Chapel when they were remodeling it. Several people received little pieces and and I just, I just found it so interesting and I was always eyeing it in her studio and eventually she gave it to me. But um, uh, this piece reflects on the meditative state of being in that Rothko non-denominational uh, non environment and the serene setting and you think and you contemplate. And so kind of like the way I look at history and the way I think on, on history and I think and contemplate and sometimes I go into the rabbit hole. Sometimes it's not really that easily accessible. Sometimes the knowledge isn't there. And um, so upon, uh, upon using this piece, I riffed it off of it. And, and there's different dimensions. As you walk around this uh, triangular piece, uh, somewhat human skill and width. Um, there are different examples for me as the accessibility to history and how we have to dig or we have to pull it apart. Things have to be dismantled. Things are hidden uh, and we just have to dig at it. And so uh, in the different pieces, um, they'll have different angles of the shape that resonate through uh, this particular piece of steel. So um, working with the steel helped to like pull me back uh, to that familiar connection, which um, brings me to this piece over here. Um, and uh, meditate um, out of the South um, migration. In this particular piece, again, I'm using a portal and it's window-like. I just find myself drawn to found objects that have like these portals and these windows. So in this particular piece, I use like these uh, found objects, these uh, car parts, clothing, kind of like industrial looking things. And it's all a narrative for my family history. My family history being from out of Mississippi um, and moving up north, many of them went to St. Louis, East St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, just like in the Great Migration, which happened uh, within black communities uh, here in the South um, from the years of 1910 to uh, 1970 in this movement of trying to find something better for your life, find something better for your family. And um, so in this vortex, which has often been um, compared to uh, Lee Montague, I, I tell a story through these pieces. Um, in Africa, there is a tradition of storytelling and it's done by a griot. And I look at the work as being like a griot and speaking about, uh, speaking about things in culture and heritage because a lot of my work wraps around the lesser known uh, events and people of the African diaspora. And I tell these stories just like the griot in, in a visual manner. So um, let's see. Then in the next gallery, I have another piece called Auntie. Auntie is um, a part of a, a series of works that I do. I do these works that are like tapestries using newspaper balls and chicken wire and uh, recycled material. And so a lot of it is like recycled, reused um, objects and materials when I create these works that, you, that have been focusing on uh, femininity and um, the uh, 
female form, body positivity, and um, race. Uh, so also, it's a great time to work with family. These pieces have generally anywhere from 7,000 newspaper balls to, I don't know, um, to like 5,000 newspaper balls where family and friends, we have conversations, they're throwing balls at me and we're stuffing these little um, holes and we're talking as I'm making these grid patterns to create these uh, giant tapestry type uh, uh, tapestries. So, um, at any rate, this particular iteration, I use um, I use photography. Um, a photographer in the MFA program, um, Blea Kubra, uh, assisted me in taking this awesome photos, and um, I was able to get the image of Auntie uh, and sew it. And using like this um, tradition, coming from a family that sews, coming from a family that uh, crochets. Um, and bringing this craft into a fine art setting, um, things that are considered crafty or women's work. And so, and, and um, auntie, it symbolizes a lot of um, those type things. So when you're starting, do you, uh, do you start with the concept or the materiality? the materiality, I'm big on materiality. And I'm like, I keep finding myself using steel, but um, un unless I'm using the uh, tapestry, doing the tapestry work, and that's usually like more of a meditative, more of a community building type of uh, practice. But um, yes, I do use find o found objects, and I'm thinking about stories, and thinking about narratives, and I'm working, assembling, assemblage, using assemblage, putting these things together. Okay, the audience has a lot of questions. <laughs> just gonna come over here. Oh, sure. <laughs> You're first. Uh, I was just gonna ask, like, what came first? Like, did you find your love for still before knowing the history of what you kind of explained to us a little earlier, or did that history come to you first and then you went and gravitated towards still? Oh, no, no, I had this dope professor, professor uh, Francis Giampetro, and <laughs> yeah, y'all take his class if you can. Uh, no, but, um, <laughs> um, and like just learning to work with the steel, I just felt like I was vibing with it, learning to weld and it just like in um, pl plasma cutting and like using the grinder and everything. And just like, I'm like, this feels good. You know, I'm tapping into this, like, I don't know the side of the strengthening side or, I don't know, it was just exhilarating working with these materials. And then to find out this family connection, I'm like, I don't know, maybe it's like, it was meant to be that, you know, I had this family member that was brought to this country enslaved specifically because he had a particular type of skill. And so, yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Who else? Raise your hand. Kat, um, all these pieces have hard edges, except for the one in the back. Can you explain that? Which, which one? Uh, the curved edges. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just rip that page of history, flip it upside down, and turn it on its head. <laughs> no, um, I was just thinking about just like the different ways that I've approached things. and. Um, just like this, this hardcore story going, story going uh, into peer reviews, studying and researching, but then also talking to people, um, going out to communities, and, and because not for this work in particular, other works that I've done, this has been my approach towards uh, trying to research and find out, because I want to tell people's truths. The, we're not a monolith as um, a race of people and I want to tell different people's stories and so I just look at that work as just like how you approach just different things. Um, what's the name of this piece right here again? Um, in, uh, in, out of the South, Migration. Okay, so when I look at it, I know the name of it, but it makes me think about the migration. 
and the way you utilize car parts and like these found objects of uh, like clothing and other things. Um, when you were making it, like what, and then the portal part, like thinking of it as a portal, and I could just see like us being pulled through that little open entrance space, and it really just speaks to that. What is something when you were making it that you were really just like, uh, was the anchor in creating it? The anchor, woo, this strong family history. Um, growing up, uh, the early part of my life in St. Louis, I remember neighborhoods being filled with families, playing on the block, playing baseball at the park with my friends, um, enjoying the community. Going back as an adult, a lot of those buildings are completely abandoned. They're like ghost towns. And thinking about the migration of ancestors that went up there to build lives and then to see the city abandoned in the inner city part like it was in those neighborhoods um, was really like shocking. So a lot of that was motivating and moving to me. And I can imagine what um, families having come from the south, you know, and coming up north and going back to visit, we would always have I would always have those stories from my grandmother or my grandmother's cousins and it's just, it's, it's just different. And so like that kind of like sweeping up in that movement and it was all, it went into that energy of weaving these clothes uh, throughout these pieces, throughout that piece. Other questions? Okay, then I'll ask my favorite one, which is what's, what's next for you? Ooh, what's next for me? Well, um, I've been uh, writing to several residencies, um, and I um, really plan to really delve off into the tapestry pieces and make quite a few more of those, and um, working with these grids and, and putting together like um, these, these, these structures that try to personify womanhood, try to personify the, sprint, the strength in it. And um, so working forward, yeah, I'm just like giving a full concerted effort at uh, my practice. Well, thank you. <laughs>